I promised the camera people I would sit down throughout this talk. I can't, I can't get myself to do it. Okay, so um, <clears throat> uh, where do I begin? Uh, well, first of all, um, I'd like to parenthesize everything I'm about to say by saying essentially that all of it, in one way or another, is wrong. And I think that's a good place to start. Second, the twittering machine uh, that I talk about in this book and that I'm going to be talking about today is not about hard drives and software. It is about writers and writing. That's what this talk is about. Uh, an industrialized system of writing, in fact, the world's first ever mass open air collective writing experiment. Just by the way, out of a certain deference to the um, materiality of writing and its importance, I do have a script here. I'm going to stick pretty rigidly to it. If you think it seems a bit deadpan at first, just bear with me and we'll get into it, trust me. Um, as I was saying, an industrialized system of writing, um, the world's first ever mass open air collective writing experiment, a strange system of writing, if you think about it, underwritten as it were, by systems of digital writing that pay no heed to the phonetic or semantic properties of alphabetic writing. Everything we see on the internet, says philosopher Sandy Baldwin, is writing. Every file, every window, every app on every device is writing. As in the matrix, the image that we see, even the image of letters and commas and full stops, is itself an ideal abstract representation of a far more complex system of digital writing. Now, writing historically didn't begin with the alphabet, which represents the human voice. Not all writing is a congealment of the spoken word or the spoken thought. Writing began with knots and notches, notched wood, kipus, which were knotted pieces of colored string which you would read with practiced motions of the hand, rather like you would read Braille. Um, before text, there was textiles. Many forms of writing have no reference to the human voice whatsoever. Think about seismographic writing. Think about musical notation. Think about circuit diagrams. Think about knitting patterns. Now writing begins with noughts and ones. The computerization of capitalism has, has upended the older hierarchy of writing. Because in the past, there was a hierarchy of written authority, beginning usually with the holy text, a constitution, Bible, royal decree, something like that, flowing down through churches, education systems, media, all the way down to the lowliest diarist and uh, writer of letters to the editor in green ink. Now we have a new constitution, one that no one was ever consulted about. It is written digitally, not alphabetically. Its writing doesn't represent voices, but automated human purposes. Every computer program, says Benjamin Bratton, is a political program. Or as the anarchist collective Tikkun puts it, referring to the cybernetic hypothesis that human and machine behaviors are controlled by programmed and reprogrammable feedback loops, this th hypothesis is intrinsically political because it conceives of each of us in our individual behavior as something that is piloted in the last instance by the need for the survival of the system that makes it possible. Now the cybernetic constitution has looped us all into ever-expanding writing systems. We're writing more than ever before in human history at school, at work, in our uh, work breaks, during our toilet breaks, uh, commutes, at parties, um, according to some surveys during sex, must be terrible sex. Abruptly scripturient, possessed by a violent desire to write. And what are we writing into being if not yet more digital images? To live in a world of digitally written images is to live in a simulacrum. So we have birthed currently the world's most profitable industry. Um, I remember back in the day, it used to be the Halliburtons and, you know, uh, energy consortiums and so on that were the, the top dog in terms of industry globally. Well, now it's Google and Facebook. Uh, and this industry, I shall call the social industry. I suggest we call it that in order not to dignify it by calling it social media. That term is instant <coughs> propaganda. All media are social. 
all technologies for that matter, are social. Who would object to something called social media? It's a bit like calling your cigarettes friendship sticks. They can be used in that way, but that's not what they're for. The social industry emerged out of a capitalist appropriation of the cyber left. Free stuff, conversation, low-cost association, even protest, all of these were the values of the cyber left back in the day. And the question was how to make money out of that. Because it's not, um, it's not straightforward how you can turn that into a commodity. Well, here's part of an answer. Before Twitter, there was text mob. Some of you probably have heard of it. I assume some of you haven't, so I'm going to tell you what it was. Text mob was an app that was created by activists, for activists, protesting outside Democratic and Republican conventions in 2004. Basically, the app was invented in order to by bypass increasingly aggressive policing. Um, it, which in the American context could involve uh, tear gas, mass preemptive arrests, uh, considerable amounts of violence if need be, jamming of your communications infrastructure, all sorts of things. Um, so activists wanted to decentralize their operations so that you know, a preemptive arrest wouldn't decapitate the whole thing. Um, and that necessitated that they had a good communications infrastructure, one that the police couldn't jam, and it needed to be inconspicuous uh, in use so that the organizers wouldn't be spotted and arrested. The answer was to design an app that relies on an already successful mass technology. That's mobile phones, uh, SMS texting. And so everybody who signed up to this app, essentially what would happen was they would receive texts from other users, updating them about the protest in real time. And that really worked. Um, in as much as it enabled them to organize uh, flash mobs and quick changes in tactics and respond quickly if activists got hurt, injured, and so on, as sometimes happened. It wasn't actually until 2008 that the New York City's lawyers figured out how the activists had outflanked the police. Um, and they started issuing subpoenas demanding you know, the information on the users of this app. But by that time, one of TechSmob's designers had already moved on to a small venture capital funded tech firm called Odeo. Um, and in 2006, he and his colleagues had delivered a presentation for the bosses um, of this firm about uh, a little app that they had worked on called TechSmob. Um, and they described its successes and you know, um, the, the reasons why they'd been successful with it. Shortly thereafter, the bosses brainstormed, and they had this idea for a cool app, which would be, you know, like texting, but in public. Amazing. Twitter, as the name suggests, wasn't designed for activists, but to enable, in their terms, short bursts of meaningless communication. Unlike TextMob, it had no security, no protection from police surveillance, because its whole economic model dependent upon surveillance. You're on there to be surveyed, to give them your data. However, apart from this, there was actually nothing to stop activists from using it, uh, provided they were happy enough to be doing so in public. So Twitter built its brand through mass movements, courtesy in part, actually, of a State Department slogan, um, Twitter Revolutions. I should just briefly mention how that came about. Um, it was in the context of the Iranian Green Movement, the Obama administration was uh, quite close to Silicon Valley. Um, and that was logical because the Clinton administration had laid a lot of the groundwork and foundation for the internet in the first place. Uh, it wasn't something that came out of, you know, any, uh, it wasn't something driven by consumer demand or anything like that. It was something that they thought was necessary to modernize American capitalism and to extend its global power. Um, and so they started to build up the infrastructure back in the 1990s, and they developed really close uh, relationships with mass telecommunications corporations and so on. So uh, there, there was a, a history of cooperation there between the Democratic Party leadership and the Silicon Valley um, uh, firms, even though a lot, of, a lot of Silicon Valley inclines more toward a kind of libertarianism. Anyway. Um, so there was a, a logical alliance there, and there was a kind of ideological uh, basis for it too, you know, because the internet had been sold from the start as a liberalizing uh, machine, as something 
wherein people would uh, discover a kind of utopian way of existence whereby they could uh, be themselves without being bound by identity, by age, by skin color, by you know all of this other stuff. They could just be whoever they wanted to be. This was MCI's adverts for the internet back in the 1990s. So anyway, there's the idea that the internet is this liberating force and it's going to liberate people in a way that promotes American, Washington, centrist liberal values. Um, and so the Green Movement's happening and the State Department thinks it's quite important that Twitter, uh, which is being used by a small number of Iranian activists, is not you know, in anything like mass use at this point, but a small number of Iranian activists are using it to disseminate information, uh, which is first of all helping the movement against the regime and second of all embarrassing the regime, something which Washington found quite useful at that time. And they got in touch with the bosses uh, and said, we understand that you're going to have a down period because you need to do some upgrading on the service and whatever else you need to do. Please don't do that. What's happening in Iran is a Twitter revolution. Now, uh, this, uh, as you will have inferred, is bullshit. There it wasn't any such thing, but the slogan stuck and it become the basis of uh, a sort of media trope that was repeated throughout 2010, 2011, uh, during the Arab Spring, and so on. Anyway, this is just uh, a way of describing how this emerging industry, which made an industry out of our social life, commodified radical desires, and also how it thrived amid a crisis of sociality. I'll come back to that in a moment. The network also emerged during a stalemate for political organization because, you know, at some ontological level, I think activists had figured out that uh, organizations consist of networks. And so many people thought, well, if we can use networks uh, in the appropriate way, we can bypass the traditional political party with all its faults, and we can bypass traditional NGOs with all their faults, uh, and all the civil society leaderships, and we can have a sort of a horizontal um, uh, organization that uh, emerges almost, you know, wherein complexity emerges out of apparent anarchy and chaos. Um, now, as it turns out, networks aren't particularly horizontal. That's not how it works. But this was, uh, this was part of the appeal of the social industry when it first started to emerge. It also, as I say, it offered to make up for the massive decline in social interactions, measurable on several indices over the last few decades. Um, as one of Twitter's founders suggested, where people felt alone, where they were in crisis, where, for example, an earthquake had struck, perhaps physically, perhaps metaphorically, or they just needed news or company or consolation, the network would be there. Networks there when society isn't. So the Twitter machine was born just as neoliberal capitalism 1.0 entered an historic crisis. It, uh, this machine accelerated an inherent, uh, a crisis of inherited political authority, destroying the authority of journalists and news media, in part because if you see how journalists behave on social media, you realize they're actually just as petty and trivial as the rest of us. And the same thing goes for politicians quite a lot of the time too. So it's been a radically desublimating experience. Um, it's also sucked revenues out of the dying print empires, of course, because of the uh, new ecologies of advertising. And it's ended the old one-way traffic of ideological meaning. What do I mean by that? Well, you could interpret it lots of ways, but I'm I'm old enough to remember when, uh, if you, for example, went on a protest over some issue of, let's say, inequality, um, you had to wonder, are they even going to talk about this? Is it going to appear on the news? Uh, is the BBC going to cover it? Is it going to, you know, maybe The Guardian will run uh, a picture of a placard hanging off a fence somewhere as a sort of artistic designation of about 100,000 people marching in the streets. I don't know. But basically the idea was you might not even get covered. And so therefore, what effect has your protest had? You've had this mass protest, hardly anybody's seen it because you've marched down one street or two or three streets in London. You don't have to think about that now. I mean, it's almost certain that whatever, whatever you do, um, 
it's not so much a question of whether it will get covered, it's already mediated, it's hyper-mediated, because it's going, uh, everything that's being done uh, around it is going on online, and it has an audience. Okay. Um, so that's one of the ways in which the one-way traffic of ideological meaning, where the television or the newspaper broadcasts meaning at you, is over. Um, at the same time, just as capitalist crisis and austerity meant far less communal stuff and jobs available, the industry offered an abundance of free stuff, free conversation, as I mentioned, but also quite a lot of free downloads, free sharing. Um, and it also offered lots of ways to make up for lost income. TaskRabbit, Uber, Airbnb, commodify every last bit of spare time, every spare room, uh, if you've got a, a motorcycle that you don't use on the weekend, something like that. Much as digitalization per se created new production efficiencies and new globally integrated supply chains, much as the cybernetic <coughs> offensive of capital dissolved traditional modes of mass working class organization, look what happened to the car industry uh, under the Toyotist model of production. Much as digital labor improved the surveillance capacities of capital over both consumers and workers, much as digital technologies have created a more globally integrated vortex of capital integrated by finance capital, which um, uh, it might well be the real sort of subject of history, uh, much more so than the proletariat. What does this industry ask in return for the, sorry, the conveniences that it offers us? Because we're, after all, not its consumers. That's well known. Uh, and nor are we voters in some sort of cyber democracy. Um, it's neither a state nor a market, in other words. It's something new, something different. And the answer appears to be that we're both lab rats and wageless laborers. Far more than Adorno's culture industry, the social industry integrates us from above. It programs our interactions with an invariant written formula, or to use Benjamin Bratton's um, sort of uh, formulation, we have a, a liberty of ends, but a tyranny of means. Um, and this produces new types of conformity which almost go under the radar because they're taken for granted. They're written into the system. So this is a strange new techno-political regime which combines the surveillance powers of states, the market control of business empires, and the ideological power of mass media. In fact, realistically, it's a lot more sophisticated than mass media because, first of all, it has no ideological agenda. Some of you will remember Mark Zuckerberg um, saying a few years ago that if his users wanted Holocaust denial, he didn't have a problem with that. As, if they found that useful, why should he? Uh, he had to backtrack on that very quickly because there was a big backlash, um, uh, understandably so. But he wasn't lying. He was telling an important truth about what his industry is committed to. It's a kind of informational nihilism. They have reduced information <coughs> to somatic impact. I'll come back to that. So it has no ideological agenda in that sense. That's purified a tendency that was already present in the old mass media. You know, the old mass media, insofar as they were advertising vehicles, as Facebook and so on are, um, they had this tendency towards a kind of content agnosticism. It didn't really matter what you put in as long as you got the eyeball attention. But, of course, they also had other things. They had proprietors with their agendas. They had journalists with their ideas of what good news is. They had editors with their own professional ideologies. There was an inherited idea of what makes up a newspaper. Well, Facebook doesn't care about that. That's why it's so effective. They don't care. They just chop and change. They d d cut up news into little segments, which they can fit into a very carefully, algorithmically tailored feed, and uh, feed it to you like that. So it's a lot more sophisticated. And it reaches us on a level that's both highly massified and highly personalized. What I mean by that? Well, it's highly massified in as much as you know, it relies upon, um, its power relies <coughs> upon data which is collected in bulk. Um, I've been on Twitter since, I don't know about you all, but I've been on Twitter since about 2009. And I have no idea how much data I've given them in that time, but probably a lot. I mean, the, the amount you give them just by spending a few minutes uh, scrolling through is immense. Now, if you take the, uh, I 
can't remember how many users they have, but they have several hundred million users, okay? It's not as big as Facebook at all, but several hundred million users, and they're quite influential users by and large. That's what Twitter is for. It's for actors, celebrities, writers, news editors, and academics, and what have you. Anyway, uh, if you take that sort, of, uh, that sort of data, that's incredibly valuable data, and it's massified. And then it means that they have an awful lot of um, anybody who is able to leverage that system by, for example, uh, using it in political campaigning as Donald Trump did, uh, or by uh, using it for commercial purposes as Nando's do, or as KFC did, you know, or do. Um, they're going to have a much more effective means of reaching you than if they just did a traditional um, advert in a newspaper. Um, it's highly massified because they know a lot about us, but it's also highly personalized. Um, and it's highly personalized in as much as your feed, of course, is carefully tailored for you. Your feed uh, is algorithmically designed to get you to react. Um, and this is one of the perverse effects, by the way. If you ever have this experience where Twitter or w whatever platform you prefer seems to be out to wind you up, by putting onto your nose content that drives you nuts. You know, you know that how it is. You pick up your phone, and you're a little bit bored. And after looking at it for three minutes, there's like two or three things that have got you really wound up. Somebody said something stupid. A friend said something really disappointing. You know, or you know, there's uh, whatever it happens to be. The latest hashtag thing is is stupid. Um, and the only catharsis is to type. I'll come back to that, but the point is that they have very carefully selected everything that appears in your feed because they know that it's the kind of thing that makes you type. And that's all they care about, somatic impact. So this is a techno-political regime that bisects business and politics. It has no message, but it is profoundly ideological. More vividly now than ever before, the medium is the message, and that message is always close by in our pockets. On the social industry, we have no rights, only incentives and controls. And the condition for our access to tools that seem to lubricate association and wayfinding is that we write constantly. Even when we're watching, even when we're just watching a clip, we're still writing in digital language. And we can write to anyone we like. We can write to celebrities, porn stars, jihadists, politicians. We can write to exes and people we used to hate at school. But really, what we're doing is we're writing to the machine. We confess our secrets, and it takes a digital copy of the message and passes it on. What is our incentive, then, to participate in an industry like this, that uses us like this? One answer is addiction. The guilty confessions of former social industry bosses suggest that we are users, much as heroin addicts are users. But that raises the question, what is addiction? What are we talking about when we call it addiction? How can you be addicted to writing? Do we get a little dopamine buzz whenever we see the bright red notifications, which are like you know, a clickbait link? You won't believe what these three people have said about you. Um, do we get, uh, you know, this is what the social industry thinks, by the way. This is what their bosses say. I think they're wrong. And neuroscientists will tell us that dopamine doesn't give us a high or any such thing. That's not how it works. Addiction can be no more reduced to a chemical process than being in love. Um, and perhaps addiction can be considered a form of love, a way of being devoted to the wrong things when the relationships in our lives disappoint us or don't work. What is it we're supposed to be addicted to? Likes, shares, the lure of celebrity on a machine where the goal is to cultivate a personal idol. Perhaps. Except that like all celebrities, we're constantly drawn to the sort of lure of self-destructive auto-iconoclasm. And the name for that, technical term for that, is the shitstorm. <laughs> Addiction isn't all about pleasure. Smokers, heroin addicts, gamblers, drinkers, all are administering small doses of death. And so are we. We are hooked on a barrage of information, 
goading us into further interactions, every feed a force feed. And as I, as I say, the only catharsis in that situation is to keep typing. And with the urge to write fast and the incentive of a competitive like hunt, a culture formed by the values of hierarchy, status, and competition that are worshipped by a handful of Northern Californian men who ultimately shape these devices, what we type will as often as not be grandstanding, showboating, sadistic, backstabbing, trolling, facile, uninformed. Please follow me on Twitter, at Leninology. Um, because this is what happens when politically generative relationships and emotions are commodified. We are devoted to a furnace of meaning where the somatic onslaught of information never selects for accuracy. A volatile combination of a stock market of sentiments, 24-hour news, and neighborhood watch, dominated by the network of media firms, politicians, marketing and PR agencies, corporations, micro-celebrities and macro-celebrities who make up most of the traffic. They talk of freedom of information as the ultimate good. But they know, because it's their economic model, that information is never free. Information is a system of controls and surveillance. That is what cybernetics means. Freedom of information or speech is the industry's code for its monopoly over its content, which must never ever be challenged by users or regulators or democratic governments. The mass production of information, more now in recent years than ever before in human history, um, makes the world more enigmatic, not less. Information is revenge porn. It's doxing. It's Tommy Robinson videos. Information is necrotic. Information is what's etched on your headstone. Information is the stars over your grave. Study after study suggests that time on the social industry is correlated to increased depression, self-harm, and suicidal behavior. But if we weren't already more depressed than we've been for a long time, would this be our remedy? Would the red pill be the powerful antidepressant that it so palpably is and so dangerously is for so many young white men? We go on the machine because we're lonely and depressed. It offers us an addictive remedy which makes us more lonely and more depressed. The social industry is a chronophage. A chronophage is a monster that eats time. There's um, an art installation in Cambridge. It's called the Corpus Clock. And on top of that clock, there's a monster that sits turning the wheel of time. And as it turns the wheel, it snaps its jaws open and shut to consume each passing second. An industry that monetizes time on device as the gambling industry calls it, replaces the tick of the clock with key clicks and thumb taps. A near-death experience, measuring out its approach. Tap, tap, tap. The temporal, <clears throat> the temporal experience of social industry platforms is different from clock time. As in casinos or pubs, where the signs of the passing of time are blocked out to keep you there, the social industry absorbs you into a different temporal flow. Following Natalie Dow Schull, we could call it the machine zone, a state akin to the ticker trance that stock market junkies used to get into when they would review the ticker tape explaining what's happening in the stock market. The industry doesn't ever tell you the time. It gives you the age of each post. That's information about the state of the game so that you can roll the dice. It's also, curiously, a temporality that's always intensifying, always cresting towards culminations, to the latest hashtag frenzy, to the latest, dare I say it, woke frenzy, to the latest celebrity frenzy, whatever it happens to be. J.M. Berger, who is a security intellectual and in other respects not particularly interesting, um, wrote in the context of ISIS uh, about the social industry as a carrier for millennial contagion. T 
time on the social industry is apocalyptic time. If life is defined by what we attend to, the attention economy turns life into raw material for extraction. It drills into our lunch hours, our tube journeys, our gatherings, and yes, even our sex lives. So some averages here, just to finish off, and I want you to take all this with a pinch of salt. These figures are never um, as precise or accurate as they appear to be, but I need some figures to work with. 135 minutes a day. That's roughly the average uh, length of time spent by a global internet user each day on one of the platforms. In a span of life of 71 years, which is the global life expectancy average, that's 50,000 hours. a lot of time to pursue a lot of projects. Addictions happen behind our backs in small decisions. I'll just have this one drink. I'll just have answer this one tweet. I'll have this one last cigarette. Tap, tap, tap. That's your life disappearing. We don't have to do this. So we are entitled to ask the minimum utopian question what else could we be doing if not this?